Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I am your host, Chris Doris, and every once in a while, we like to switch it up a little bit, and we're doing that this week. We've got another highlight reel for you where we go back into the archives and we, we select a handful or two handfuls of our amazing badass guests and we, uh, we, we pick out some nuggets of mental toughness gold and we put them together in a, in a highlight reel here for you. So we've got that for you today. Now, as a reminder, uh, if you're not getting the notifications of uh, the Tough Talks and blog posts and, and if you aren't getting your 6 a.m. daily dose, the daily dose, that's my morning email blast where I send out the daily dose of mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less, then we need to address that. Let's go ahead and just resolve that issue, if that's the case, by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S. ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists. Put your name and email and bam, we hook you up with all the goodies. All right, enjoy the reel. And as always, until next time, create miracles. I have always had a mindset of go for stupid. Don't go for what you can achieve. Don't go for the impossible, because if you say the word impossible, subconsciously, you're already recognizing it. It can't be done. You're giving yourself a get out of jail card there. Mm. Well, what did you expect? I said it was impossible. That kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I've always gone for stupid. So when someone asks me for something, I never give it to them. I give them what they need, lust, and desire for, which is usually what you've got to unearth in the conversation. And I had a client of mine contact me and he said, hey, I'm going to Florence. I'm having di uh, I'm with the uh, uh, future, uh, future wife. I'm going to meet the mother-in-law and father-in-law. I need to expose how powerful I am. Make me look good. Give me a dining, keyword, experience. Now, if he hadn't have had the word experience, I could have got him a great table, maybe the chef's table in the kitchen, maybe got the chef to come over and hang out. I could have done that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. But it was the experience that he, that he came up with. And I went, all right, okay. How can I take his request, simsitize the thing, That's and go stupid? And so <laughs> I allowed my permission to dream without ridicule or parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And both of those things are what we do at our house. How many times do we go, well, I'd like to do this, but what would the neighbors say? You know, oh, what, would, what would my buddy say? Oh, my God, they'd laugh at me. Gives a shit. Go for things out of parameter and out of ridicule and just to see what's out there. Yeah, that, that whole notion of oneness. You know, the bodhicitta is the whole notion of the awakened heart, the uh, enlivened heart. But what that requires very often, Chris, as you know, because you've been to the oneness university, is the vulnerability to your own frailty. And so many of us, we are afraid A, to be vulnerable and B, to embrace our frailties. You know, what is it that will take you to your knees weeping like a baby? But if without that, you don't have the capacity for compassion for others. Oh. Got to be able to have that. Now we can be sympathetic because when you got sympathy, you can go help somebody. Let me do that for you. Let me give you this. Let me get you this, which gives us value and meaning because it's a doing. Whereas vulnerability and fragility is a being. And we're, we can be that moment by moment by moment and live from that place with a level of mental toughness and emotional security that not only grows us, but it serves others. But yeah, so like, you know, just um, at first, you know, like I said, it's like a brick hitting you in the face. It just blows you out and you just knocks you down. And, and like I said, that first month, man, like, that's just like that. It's literally like, just man, absorbing it. You know, it literally took a month for me to even absorb that news. It's like, no way, you know, but. I know, the, since they're giving, they're telling you you only got three of them and it took you. Uh, yeah. How about, you know what I mean? You're right. Like, so I'm wasting a month of my time doing this, but the, the, the thing though, is that once I started getting, I had to get blood infusions every week because my blood count was so low. I was like, they were saying I was like three way, three days away from dying, going to the hospital in the first place. Like when they first saw me, they're like, 
I've never seen anyone with a hemoglobin of four walk into a hospital. And so that was another freaky thing. It's like, yeah, you know, I barely made it. And, uh, but once I started getting the blood transfusions and getting energy back and, and the ability to eat and swallow because the chemo was reducing the tumor, I'm telling you what, man, that just, you know, I'm a kind of a positive optimistic guy anyway. And that just gave me so much fuel. It's like, this thing is getting better. And I was beating the shit out of me. Like I was losing weight. I was down to 145, down from 185. But that's the other moment I had too, Chris. Like I looked at the scale. I said, I'm 145. I was like, I'm not going out like this. There's no way I'm going out like this. Like I, I have to do whatever I have to do. So I started working out, lifting weights, you know, being as active as I can. I mean, it wasn't easy. Don't get me wrong. You know, it wasn't not easy at all, but what other choice do you have at that point? You know what I mean? Like you have to do what you can in your control of the situation to make the best of it. And that's the mindset I started with when I saw the scale 145, man. And, you know, I never looked back, never looked back once. I just started believing like this thing's working. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. You know, and, and that, that's kind of how I, I absorb that information. You know? My favorite quote from Warren Buffett is that busy is the new stupid. <laughs> like he says no 95% <laughs> of the time and busy is the new stupid. The guy reads like eight hours a day. Wow. So when I hear slow down and I can see how it's lucrative, like I had been going through the hamster wheel, right? Like I'd just been showing up for work, doing some great work, being of service, you know, helping the community, but like never questioning what I wanted. Never slowing down to ask yourself a question, yeah. like what would perfect look like for me vocationally? That's right. So slow down, like the best analogy for me is like a 10 speed bike. Because when I heard slow down as a New Yorker, that's like blasphemous, man. Like what I hear from, you know, as a, as a New Yorker of slow down, it's like going slow or it means I'm going to lose momentum. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about that level of slowing down. What I'm talking about, like as a 10 speed bike, oftentimes at that moment in my life, I was in a one, one gear. I was just, you know, when your bike's in a one, one gear, legs are moving fast, but you're not really going too far. Mm -hmm. So to me, slowing down is when you upgrade those pedal strokes, you upgrade those questions you're asking yourself. Now I'm in a four, six gear where my legs are going slower, but my momentum's taking me further. You really know your 10 speed gear lingo. Pretty. That's yeah. a very impressive actually. Thank you, thank you. And I only had like a mongoose, so that's pretty even more <laughs> impressive. The thing I like about sex and sexual optimization, if you will, is that having a healthy sex life touches on really all aspects of health. Like it touches on physical health um, through blood pressure and cardiovascular risk and sleep and things like that. Oh. It touches on, um, you know, mental, emotional health. Uh, for instance, it helps with decreasing depression and anxiety and, and making you have sort of better self-confidence and, and, you know, helps your relationships. So you have that as well. It helps with spiritual health. Like it basically touches on all kind of six main areas of health, including mental health. I think that there's a huge mental component to, um, to sexual health. That it, it, you know, it, it really is helpful. If you have a good sex life, it makes you feel better about yourself, about your life, about your relationships. And I think that helps get through the day in all different, all different ways. What are those six main areas of health? Um, physical health, emotional health, mental health, spiritual health, social health, and environmental health. Wow. In one word, what is the secret to success? Well, we say giving in the story. I, I think really it, it needs a, a tiny bit more of an explanation for in, in right. that when we say giving in this case, so, so you, we would say, what's the, what's the premise of the go-giver, right? It, it, it's that shifting your focus, just like Joe had to learn how to do, and just like I had to learn how to do back in the day, that shifting your focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, Whoa. understanding that doing so is not only a, a more pleasant way of conducting business, it's also the most financially profitable. But Chris, not, not for some way out there, woo-woo, magical, mystical type of reasons. It actually makes very rational sense. When you're that person who can take your focus off of yourself, 
and mm. place it on helping others, discovering what they want, what they need, what they desire. When you can take your focus off yourself and place it on helping people solve and overcome their challenges, their problems, when you can take your focus off yourself and place it on helping bring others closer to happiness, okay? Mm. Mm. People feel good about you. They, they want to get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in relationship with you. They want to do business with you if appropriate, and they want to tell others about you and be your personal walking ambassadors. <laughs> Whoo, baby, man, I'm going to go running right now. <laughs> so First of all, I cut out all alcohol and caffeine two weeks out from the race. Because okay. I've definitely noticed, especially, you know, through college, now being out of college, alcohol will certainly affect my thoughts, certainly affect my confidence. So right now I have, I have confidence blurring out of my fingertips because I haven't woken up hungover in almost two weeks now. That is one of the biggest things. Caffeine is more so a uh, strategy for during the race. So at you know 2 a.m. when I'm 65 miles in and I need a boost, caffeine will, my tolerance is extremely low. Uh, but like you said, the prep is number one coming in with that confidence, coming in with your mind right, your body right. Um, but to elaborate on prep, my confidence mainly comes from the training leading up, those three months leading up to the race. If I didn't put in the effort, if I didn't put in any miles, it's a little bit harder to be strong up here. But if you put in the miles, you put in the pain up front, you preloaded that effort, you got it up here. You're like, I, I put in the work for this. There's no reason why I should not finish. Uh, what kinds of um, self-talk do you got going on these days? You know, you just said something interesting, which is like I had the DNR. I haven't had a good confidence boosting finish in over two years. Mm -hmm. Why did you yeah. say that out loud? What, so what? Yeah. Uh, you know, I say that out loud more as if I'm like, I'm chomping at the bit to get another finish, you know? Well, how are you talking to yourself? You got like three days before you go for a long ass run. I've been here before. I've been here before. I've done it before. Mm. I have gotten better. I've gotten faster. I've moved to Colorado. I've been training at a mile high when I've never been doing that. Yeah. You know, I'm listing all the reasons why there's no reason I shouldn't succeed. Oh, I've that's done huge. This Stop. Perfect. That's a slow down moment, babe. <laughs> no, that's huge. What you just said is I'm listing all, this is how you're talking to yourself. This is so huge. Mm -hmm. You're listing all the reasons why you will thrive or succeed. Mm -hmm. You, that's how you're talking to yourself. And another thing, Chris, why I was happy to do this beforehand is when I actually say it out loud and I'm talking about it to you, I'm going to finish. I'm going to run another hundred miles. I like feel it build up inside of me. And it's a little harder to do it when you're just staring at yourself in the mirror. That's why like, I'll be in the car with my girlfriend and I'll just turn to her and I'll just, I'll like, I'll say what I'm going to do and she'll reinforce it too. And it's just like having that you know, that, that central friend group that like will help you reinforce whatever you say and affirm, not reinforce, reinforce, affirm. Um, and that's why I like talking about it. That's why I like giving my experience beforehand because I'm literally hyping myself up. And I don't think a lot of people really notice the value in that and not just running, but like everything you're doing. So I want to address master. Okay. before I address what we're missing. So anybody who's committed to mastery or considers himself a master knows that they're forever the student, right? Mm. So if somebody looks and says, oh, you're a master, I had um, participants in a class say, you're the guru. It's like, no, no, no. I just practice this over and over and over and over. And I know that my end learning never ends. And to answer your question around why, not, why aren't we doing this? Why don't we know? Maybe you can repeat your question to show how good I was just listening. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. So it's what are we missing out, right? So uh, okay. having not had formal training on how to be a phenomenal listener, what are we missing on? Which is basically another way of saying what's our incentive to invest like real effort into strengthening significantly. Absolutely. So our often oftentimes we're missing the, the full picture right? We're missing the big picture. We're missing, we're missing an entire like embodied experience. Cause most people will think of listening as, Oh, what did I hear through my ears? Not what did I 
take in with all five of my senses. So I can see you right now, and that's a form of listening. So I can see you and every message that comes in, whether it's through my eyes, whether it's through my ears, whether it's through what I smell, like messages can have a taste to them, right? Like see, touch, feel, all the five senses. It's like, if I'm willing to listen with all five senses, not gonna go to the sixth sense realm, right? But if I'm willing to listen in all of those ways, I'm going to more often than not experience or hear something that I didn't hear had I only been listening with my ears. 